So Revelation chapter 14. Verse 13 through 19. And then chapter 15. So we've seen up to this point in Revelation the tribulation that, it, that is to come upon this world in the last seven years of this world. We've seen how terrible it is and what the things that are going to happen, the wars that are happening. We've seen a third, at least a third of the water turn to blood in the world. Death. Over a third of the people in the world are dead. Earthquakes. And all these disasters upon the world. And most, most of them have come from man. We see that the Antichrist is in control and he will be in control for a season, the last seven years of this earth. He will be ruling until the day that Jesus comes back. People will sell their soul to the devil. You know, oh, we grew up with that stuff in those kinds of movies. You're going to sell their soul to the devil, but actually people do. Those that will take the number and ally themselves with the Antichrist, sold their soul to the devil, they are going to be dropped in the lake of fire. It's just the way it's going to be. In Jesus, because of God's faithfulness during the tribulation, he takes care of his own, the 144,000. He brings them through the whole tribulation, and they don't get hurt. Protects them from the Antichrist and all the things that are going on. He sees his own through it. Jesus will redeem everyone who is his. The gospel will still be preached. And the world system will be destroyed. That will be the end. Justice will be done. God's justice. And he will make all things right. So you know for us, we keep our faith in the Lord and trust in him. Trust in Jesus Christ of the Bible. So we've been looking at all these things. And we do know that there are those that, those that maybe that we are ministering to today. That we are sharing the things of the Lord with today. And even telling them about what's going to happen in the world. Those that... Do, do not receive Jesus Christ. No, I'll wait till I'm old, you know, just before I die. Or, you know, whatever excuses people have. Family, friends, neighbors, those we've shared with that don't receive Jesus. And boom, God takes us out of here. Raptures us up. We're gone. And they realize, uh-oh, they were right. And so they understand not to take that number. So there's going to be many people that won't take that number that are going to have to die for their faith. Their heads will be cut off. Be very, it's better to get Jesus now, is what I'm saying. Go in when Jesus calls to his own, you know, the rapture that happens. Be one of those that go, don't be one of those who stay, unless you want to. Right? Some people say, Well, I want to go through the tribulation. They say, well, You're nuts. Read it, study it. You want to go through that? God, number one, does not pour his wrath out on his people. He, he, if, you're not, if you're his, he's going to take you out of it. But anyhow, I say, I usually say this. But you know, not, not everybody believes in the rapture. You know, that's okay. You know, it doesn't save us or not save us. I just tell people, we'll explain it to them on the way up. Woo! Because they're going to go with us if they're believers. So now, we come to Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, where it says, And I heard a voice from heaven. This is John. He's listening. You know, he's up there. He's writing all this from heaven's perspective. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. So there's going to be this rest and this reward for those who are going to be his, the faithful ones during the tribulation that didn't take the number. And, and, the, and when, they're, when they're beheaded, boom, they're going to be immediately just brought up into heaven. To be absent from the body is to be with the Father. You know, I love the saying, 1 Corinthians 15, 54, 55, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting is gone. No fear. These guys are going to die. It, it, Christ, you know, when we die in the Lord, in Christ, death, we don't have to be afraid of it. Because it's, for you and I, it's graduation day. For those of us who are a little bit older, we really understand what that means. New bodies. You know, it doesn't crack when it goes up. You know, the arms, you know, 
know, when you get out of bed, you know, you go, oh, you know, that won't be happening. You have new bodies. Long hair. Unless you don't want long hair. You see, these here, that he's talking about in this verse here, he says, they will be blessed because they will be with Jesus. And you know, they aren't the church. The church is not, you know, spoken of here in Revelation. It's always, we don't see the church here except for the scenes in heaven. We don't see the church. It's not there. So these are not the church, and they're not uh, uh, just Jews at this time. They, they have a different place uh, in eternity. You know? All right, we'll understand it when we get there. Remember, these had missed the rapture. Maybe they even... Maybe they're afraid they're miss, going to miss that, the resurrection. They're going to miss, and they're afraid they're going to be in the second death, you know. But the Lord is assuring them now they are okay and they're not left behind. Because he tells them, yes, says the Spirit, so they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow with them. Because they've been serving the Lord during that seven-year tribulation period. They've been serving the Lord then. And now they get to rest. These people will be facing things we can't even imagine. We, just, we can't imagine it. And they're going to be rewarded huge for their deeds. You know, a lot of people down here they spend all their time just gathering stuff, you know, just for their own pleasures. And they do that. But you know what? We cannot take stuff with us. And you know, I shared this with you before. I, I love this one. It's, it's about the, 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 the rich man. He knows he's going to die. And so he's with his family in their house. And, and through the years, what he's done is he stored all his stuff in the attic. All his riches. Put them in the attic. So that when he died and he went to heaven, he could grab it on the way up. That's what he's thinking. You know? So the family's there. They know that he's done this. They know everything's up in the attic. And he dies. And so as soon as he dies, they all run up to the attic. And they get to the attic and they're all standing there looking at all the stuff. And she says, I told him he should have put it in the basement. <laughs> you can't. You don't, we don't take it with us. Well, that was a joke, by the way. You know, sometimes we struggle with things. We're going through things in life. And we struggle. Why am I going through this? You know what God says? God says, just wait. It'll be worth it. Look at these guys here. He says, yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow with them. But he's going to bless them. Their deeds follow with them. They're going to be remembered the things. The things you do for the Lord will be remembered. And that, you know, that's not a reason to do them. You know, you're going to do something, well, I'm doing this so God remembers this in heaven. It's just going to be remembered. And you will be rewarded for the things you do. Now, we come to verse 14. Let's read 14 through 16. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle, sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now, there's going to be, in that final harvest, and that one sitting on the cloud, you know, i got a little one by mine that says, or, you know, it says there, or the son, or the son of man there. I think this is Jesus sitting on that cloud, with, on that cloud, with that sickle, ready to reap the harvest, man, and bring those souls back to him. Bring it back in. There's going to be many people saved right at that time. But there's going to be many that aren't. You know, we have that parable in uh, Matthew chapter 13. Why don't you turn there? The wheats and the tares. Let's look at that parable. Because it's talking about the end times. Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. 24 through 30 says, Another parable Jesus put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. While, while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the weeds and went his way. 
You know, it's, and when the tares grow up and the wheat, they look the same until the very end. And you see the wheat, and you know, they would they pick it up and they throw it in the air, you know, and, and the, the tares would blow away and the wheat lands on the ground. And then they would have to, the tares would be gone. So, the, so someone would come and put this bad stuff in with the wheat. Verse 26, but when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants, the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us to go up and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say, The reapers first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And they would separate the wheat from the tares. Now, you know, the, the side is probably going, yeah, well, well, what's that mean? Well, he explains that down in verse 36. He says, then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into his house. Then the disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. They were actually going, what the heck is he talking about? What's going on? What, what's he saying? What, uh, we'll give him a loan blast. So they asked him. And he answered and said to them, he who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. You know, the Son of Man is Jesus. He who sows, sows the good seed. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest and the end of the age and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the Son in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So we let him know what we got. Imagine that they must be one. Whoa, dude, man, that's like, heavy stuff. Burning up people. Well, we are the children of the king of the terrors are the children of the devil. You know, you and I, we share in that work. And seeds that are planted. And he plants through us in people's lives when they invite Jesus to their heart. And, and, and they produce fruit. And they become born and we're part of that. But see, it's the Lord who reaps. He's the one who reaps. We don't do the reaping. We don't do the saving. That's his work. And as we look at these, we're looking at these scriptures here, uh, coming up in, in the next verses, verses 17 to 19, I think that these verses that we're going to look at right now are those who take the mark in verse 9. Those who take the mark in verse 9 and 10. Okay? Uh, of this chapter. So it says there in verse 17, And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle, then another angel, the one who had power over fire, came out of the altar, and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth because your grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth, gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth, and threw them into the great wine press of the wrath of God. So I think... Those there that are going to are those who take the number during the tribulation. And they're taken out of the way. But in verse 20 it says, And the wine press was trodden outside the city, and the blood came out from the wine press up to the horses' bridles for a distance of 200 miles. That is the grand, that, that scripture there is speaking about the grand finale, the end of the tribulation, the battle of Armageddon. When there will be 200 miles of blood like this deep. Like a river of blood for 200 miles. Because when the armies from the east come, both in 200 million, and they all come right through the battle of Armageddon, it's going to be just crazy. It's gonna be nice. it, and it says, the Bible says, if Jesus didn't come back and stop it, there will be nothing left alive on this earth. If he comes back and stops it. The battle of Armageddon. World War, hopefully... Or hopefully that's not World War III, or it's not World War IV or V, you know. But in Joel 3.12, it says, 
and 13. Let the nations be weakened, wakened, and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's this valley we're talking about. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for the wickedness is great. Another prophecy about that in time to what's going to happen. You know, God has been holding this off for a long time. The Lord has been keeping this back for a long time. His patience and His grace and His mercy. And it's like all the armies of the world now have gathered together to stop the second coming of Jesus Christ. Because that's when He comes back. There they are in the, va the valley of Megiddo. And that's where the river of blood of the horse's bridle will be. Whoa. Listen to Isaiah 63, 1 through 4. Who is this who comes from Eden, Eden with dyed garments from Basra? This one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I, who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments look garments like the one who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me, for I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes, for the day of vengeance is my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. Talking about that event at the end times. And when he comes back, he will establish his kingdom on this earth, and it will be glorious. Now, you know, we're going to go into chapter 15 here in a minute. And we, then we're going to see in chapter 16, we're going to see the, the end of the tribulation and the things that happen. What we looked at earlier on in the other chapters are nothing compared to what we're going to look at next week. It's going to be magnified. But, let's talk about some good stuff first. Second coming, Isaiah 35, 10. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. It's going to be that day when Jesus comes back and we come back with them. It's going to be, it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be great. Isaiah 11, 6 through 9. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. The young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play in the cobra's hole, or fertilizer. And the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. Yellow jaw. No, we don't do that now, huh? Oh, weird. Yeah, we do that. They shall not hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. And we are going to come back with Jesus and rule with him while things are like that. And the knowledge of the Lord is going to be everywhere. Everybody's going to know the Lord. He's going to be ruling. This is the future of the world after sin is dealt with. Luke 21, 33 says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So, you know, in, in chapter 14 here, if we look at the end of it, here are his promises in Revelation chapter 14. Jesus will redeem everyone who is his. He is going to get us through. He's going to get those through the tribulation. He's going to get his own through. He's faithful to us. Well, the gospel will be preached during the tribulation. It's going to be preached. It's going to be out there. Everybody's going to hear it. The world system will be destroyed and it will end. The world system as we know it today, there's not going to no, 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 no longer going to be into this political garbage that goes on in the world today where it's fighting each other over stupid politics. <laughs> justice will be done, God's justice, and he will make all things right. It's going to be good. There will be a rest and there will be reward for his faithful ones. There will be a glorious harvest, even in the last days. And there will be the other harvest of the tares. Because God is just, and He's merciful, and He's right. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
the Lord is just. He's going to be just in all of his, in his judgments that he makes here. You know, sometimes you read those things, it's like, he's up to the blood, up to this and that. You go, whoa, man, God, what are you doing? But you know what? He's just. He's just. And he's loving. So now in chapter 15, we're going to start looking at the last part of the tribulation. The world will have a one world government, a one world money system, a cashless society, which you know we've been looking at this year with some of the things that happened in the chip implants, a one world religion, and all of that in defiance of God. All of it. In defiance of the one true and living God. People will have to worship and swear allegiance to the Antichrist or they will die when they get caught if they don't. This man, the Antichrist, will probably be possessed by the Satan, by Satan himself. The devil will possess him. There will be persecution like no one has ever seen. But at the same time, many will be returning to Christ through the ministry of the 144,000 and the two witnesses and, and then those who never received the mark. So in chapter 14, we saw three angels are proclaiming the gospel throughout the world during that time. Three angels, you know, the girl, the satellites, or, you know, however that works. They're going to be proclaiming the gospel. And now, we're now at the last three waves of judgment that are coming to the world. The last three waves. The last of three waves. There was one wave, there was a second wave of judgment. The third wave is coming. The first was when Jesus broke the seven sealed scroll, breaking one at a time. Each one had something that would happen to the earth. And the seals, when they were broken, you know what? They gave the world exactly what it wanted. And the seals were broken. It's like God says, is this what you want? Well, then you can have it. You know, that's a lot of tribulation happened because God lets man go his own way. Unrestrained evil. Because the Bible says... Until the restrainer is removed, the Antichrist will not be revealed. But when that restrainer is moved, he who is restraining sin today is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be taken out, and sin will have free for all like never before. You think evil, there's evil now? Wait till then. When there's no one restraining evil, no, the Spirit is out, out, and man just goes his own way. They give exactly what they want. And by God's grace, He's kept us from getting what, what we want. He saves us. He saves us. He saves us from the world, as we looked at this morning. He saves us. Saves us from hell. Saves us from the things, the evil things of the world, you know, as we lean on Him to give our, give our life to Him. You know, when God says no to us, He has a reason for it. And it's usually to protect us. It's like you who are parents, you know. Sometimes you say, you know your children, you're not trying to be mean to them, you're trying to save them from maybe doing something that's going to harm them. And that's what God does. God says no to sin. You know, he's not trying to keep people from having fun, he's trying to keep people from getting hurt. Because he loves us. So he says, no, don't do that. I think of, I think of you know, some of the pestilences we have. You know, now we have this new virus going around now, right? Like what they have... 15 people up in Lee City, I don't know if they're still sitting on the airplane or not. They wouldn't let them off. And the United States won't take them back. So I don't know where they, where they are right now. I don't know, you know what happened to them. 15 people that were Chinese that had flu symptoms, symptoms, they did not let them off the airplane. So I don't know if they finally did or, you know, I don't know what happened. But they're nuts. We hear people are dying and people are freaking out everywhere. You, look at, you think of AIDS. How do you get AIDS? Through sexual contact. And you know, if you never had, you know, if you never had sex, you probably would never get AIDS. And so if you stay in the context of one man and one woman, you're probably not going to get AIDS. It's when you're playing around is when people get it. It's sin. God said, don't do that. He said, don't play around, don't mess around. Sexual around, it's not good for you. You can die from it. Oh no, Aubrey, poison, no, it's not gonna hurt me. No, I don't know, we don't think. I try to share that with the kids in school. Don't be messing around. The older ones, not the youngest. 
you're, you're, that's like Russian roulette. Well, they don't even think about it. You could die from that. God says no because he loves us. And he allows all these things to, that are going to come and happen in Revelation, he allows all of them not to punish. Of course, his wrath is coming down. But at the same time, his heart is to save people out of it. He's still giving them the opportunity to come out of the system, to get saved. It's redemption. His wrath has to come because he's a judge. He's, he's a fair and just God. And the only way he can be fair and just is if judgment comes. But there's mercy and grace if you want it. And that's his heart. To save people out of it. To get people to turn to him. But listen, listen to what in Revelation 6, 16 and 17. When, when the heavy stuff is happening and the people are going through this tribulation and, and, the, and they said to the mountains, the people going through the tribula tribulation, and they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? Instead of saying, oh God, forgive us, forgive me. And God said, okay, I will. He's saying, hide us from him. We don't want to see his face. We don't, we don't want anything to do with him. Instead of calling out for mercy and love, which is God just say, I want to save you. I want to love you. No, they don't. He can't take them with him to heaven. If somebody doesn't want him, he's not taking them. That's why I always say it's not God sending people to hell, or it's people choosing it. Because he does everything he can to save them. He, he even has a tribulation to get people saved. And they still hide from him. Then the second way that happened, there were the seven trumpets that sound. And the world is really messed up during this, the second wave. The second, the seven trumpets sounded. One third, listen, when the seven trump, when the seven trumpets sounded, when each angel blew their trumpet, one third of the trees and the grass burned up. One three, one third of the trees and grass burned up. One third of the oceans became like blood at the sound of another trumpet. One third of the fresh water is polluted and undrinkable. Another sound of the trumpet. One third of the light of the sun, the moon, and the stars is gone at the sound of the trumpet. Then the three woes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You ain't seen nothing yet. Then the next one sounds, and guess what? Demons are on the earth and they're set free from the abyss and they torment non-believers and the people can't die when they're tormented. Nobody can die for like six months. I don't, you know, I, like me, I can't understand it. You get your head cut off and you can't die. That's pretty good intense. Death is, death is a holiday. Some 1940s or 50s movie about that I think I saw when I was a kid. Death takes a holiday and nobody can die. There will just be suffering. Then another trumpet sounds. Then a demonic army either possessed or demons wipe out a third of the population of the earth through warfare, through man's warfare. A third of the population of the earth. Come on, think of that. Twelve of us in here. Four of us are dead when that happens. Every one out of every three people dead. And what does man do? Revelation 9, 20 and 21. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murderers, their murders, or their sorceries, or their sexual immorality, or their thefts. They didn't turn from any of it. They didn't stop stealing, they didn't stop killing, they didn't stop doing drugs, they didn't stop having uh, sex outside of marriage. They just continued on. They did not turn to God. But they worshipped idols and demons. They did not change. Now, chapter 15 is preparing us for the third wave of judgments that are coming. The end, the judgment of God, His wrath is poured out. So verse 1 says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, Seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. So he sees, this line up, there are no seven more angels with these seven plagues. My goodness. 
top of the tents. This, this is like, the, say, the biggest for the end. This is the final outpouring of the wrath of God. Probably the very end of the tribulation period to usher in the return of Jesus Christ. You think, why would I love, why would God do this? A loving God. Well, judgmental. He had to, he had to judge. Man's rejection of God and, his, and the free gift that he offers. They don't want it. So judgment must come. It needs to happen. And here's the thing. Nobody has to face this. No one. He's waited, he's waited, and he's waited. It's time. I think about how many little babies are aborted every day. Killed. Innocent little babies every day. Did you know since Roe versus Wade, we've had 60 million babies? More than that now, because that was a figure from a little while ago. 60 million babies have been aborted and killed. And you say, and people say, well, well why is God going to do this? Why is judgment coming? Huh. Why hasn't it? Because God is merciful. Why does he do it? Because you know what? It is still redemptive in nature, giving man that final chance to repent and to turn to him. God uses it to save people. You know, most of us, listen, most of us, maybe not most of us in this room, but most people I know, it took problems for them to come to the Lord. Hey, I talked to my brother this morning. He told me his testimony. He got to the point in his life where he said, just flat out, we didn't want, we was done with the world, it just was not happening, just laid down on the third story of your house or something, laid down, flat out, said, Lord, I need you. I need you. I had invited Jesus in my heart when I was 12 years old, but I never walked, I didn't know how to walk, nobody would teach me, I didn't know what to do, but I was saved. So I went into drugs, sex, drugs, life, and all. I ended up going to jail, and there I was, about as low as you can get, sitting in jail. And I said, Lord, I need you. you know, so you know, problems cause people to come to the Lord. So God uses them. So He allows them in our lives. What? To get our attention. To, if that's going to save us, hallelujah. It's like our friend before she passed away. Living with a non-believing husband. And she got to the point where she prayed, whatever it takes, Lord, to save him. And then when she was dying, I was thinking, is this it, Lord? Is this what it takes for death? And maybe that's what it, it's going to take. Maybe, I don't know if he hasn't invited the Lord as hard as far as I know yet. But maybe that's what it took to lose that wife. You know, they had three great children together, and she, and she loved him, and he loved her, and, but he wasn't sick. Whatever it takes, that's what it takes. That's a hard prayer to pray. Whatever it takes, because you that could mean anything. Why does God do this? Preparation for his chosen people to wake them up. To wake them up. To receive Jesus as their true Messiah whom they rejected. See, he's not mean and revengeful, he's loving. So back to Revelation 15, verse 2 through 4 says, And I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name standing on the sea of glass, holding harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, and the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. You know, they're worshiping the Lord, singing and praising God. This is the group that was saved out of the tribulation, and this is their song. They're singing the song of Moses. Verse, back to, to chapter uh, 6 of Revelation, 9 through 11. This is them, it says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they had. 
And they cried out with a loud voice, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood of those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were completed. And now, I believe, we're at the point to fulfill that scripture. That's where we're at now. And they're singing. They're singing with the heart of God. You know what? Listen, that's what I like about that. That's a stringed instrument, right? And harp in the Greek is, is kathara. We get the word guitar from that. Maybe there's some guitars there too besides harp, right? Although, it would be cool to play a harp. Yeah, that would be fun. And they're singing the Song of Moses. You know, that's the first song recorded in our Bible. The Song of Moses. Exodus 5, 1 and 2. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider he has thrown into the sea. You know, people sing that as a kid's song. But it's, it's an adult song. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. You know what we sing? We sing the song of the Lamb. Revelation 5, 9 and 10. This is the song. This is why I, one of the reasons why I know we're in heaven. Because we sing the song of the Lamb. It says, and they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain and redeemed, redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And, and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. That's us. That's why I say we're in heaven. Maybe watching this, these things go on down here. The song of look what the Lord has done for us. You know, and we see this group again that we're looking at here. We see them in Revelation 20, verse 4. It says, Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and the judgment, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus for the word of God. Who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands, and he lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So there they are. This group sing that song in heaven. Then, verse 5, Revelation 15. And after these things I looked at the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven, and it was open. The tabernacle of God, which is pictured in the temple. On the earth. You know, they have the temple of the earth. That's a picture of that tabernacle. It, it's up there in heaven. Only this here is the real thing. It's the real thing in heaven. This is the holy of holies. You know, the Ten Commandments were the place they kept them there in the holy of holies, uh, you know, on the earth. But this is the tabernacle of testimony. God's Ten Commandments are there forever. It's going to be great. You see, the law of God is good and true. We are set free from it, but it's good and true. When the Antichrist is really down here, he changes the law. He changes the law while he's here on this earth. And then verse 6 and 7 of Revelation 15, And the seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple, clothed in linen, clean and bright, and girded around their chest with golden sashes. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever. Wow. These four living creatures, these angels, purity, holiness, and righteousness. See, a work of God is going to happen now. And they get this bowl. You know, the bowl is a kind of a flat saucer. They use it to burn incense on. You know, in the, in the temple. And it's that time now, guess what? Nothing is going to stop it. The wrath of God is going to be poured out on this earth like never before. And then in verse 8, and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. And God is on move. His power and, and his, his temple is filled with the smoke from His glory. And nobody can get in it. You can't even look at it. We've seen the glory of God two times. Other times in the Word of God. When Moses finished the tabernacle in the desert, in Exodus 40, 33 and 35, and he raised up the court all around the tabernacle and the altar and hung up the screens of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. 
Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. That's one time. The second time is when Solomon finished the temple in 1 Kings 8, 9 through 11. It says, Nothing was in the ark except the two tablets of stone which, the Mo which Moses had put there or when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Wow. You know, uh, there have been times of worship. My eyes are closed, you know. Worshiping the Lord. Oh, I can, I can almost feel the sense of the glory of God and fill this place. And I always felt like, I'm going to open my eyes, there's going to be this cloud, I'm going to fall on my face, you know. It's never happened, but you know, sometimes when you really worship the Lord, you just have that feeling, that sense. Like that. And here it is again in heaven. Revelation 16, verse 8, the glory of God in heaven. We're going to be there. We're going to be there. And we're not going in, but we're going to see it. The Shekinah glory of God. Untouchable. God's glory. And nobody comes near it. Don't come near it until it's in. And in chapter 16, we're not looking at it tonight, it hits. It's going to be, the bowl's going to be poured out, and this earth is going to be in trouble. In trouble. But I love the way 15 ends the scene in heaven, in the glory of God, His righteousness. His holiness. And they are going to be with Him. And then, when it's over with, and Jesus comes back, you and I, we're coming back with Him. You guys will be riding horses, I'm going to be on a surfboard. <laughs> I requested it, but you know, I probably won't care then. I don't like horses. I've not, I've not had good experience on horses, so... But it'll be okay. I have new body so I can probably handle it. <laughs> Lord Jesus, thank you so much again for your word and the encouragement of your word and your love for us. And even, Lord, where your wrath is being poured out. Lord, the, in the bowls and all these waves of all this stuff has been happening. Lord, you still want to save people. You still love them. Lord, you don't want anyone to perish. You don't want, you don't want to pour your wrath out on anybody, Lord, but you have to because... You're a true, just, and loving, and merciful God. So you do it, Lord. You do it. We just pray, Lord, that those who have ears to hear and those who understand when it comes to that time, Lord, they will surrender their lives to you. We know that Israel will be saved in one day. But we want to pray, pray for our loved ones, and our neighbors, our family, our friends, those we work with, those we do things with, Lord, those we come in contact with, wherever we're at. Somehow, Lord, you open up those doors for us to share with them the good news so they can know you, Father. And I know you've commissioned us to do that, Lord. You've anointed us to do that. And however that works in each of our lives, Lord, maybe it's just a smile, Lord, or whatever it may be. Lord, we just want to see people know you, Lord. Use this church right here, Lord. Calvary Chapel, right here, Lord, in this village, on this peninsula, to show your love, your kindness, your forgiveness, your mercy, and your grace. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you even desire to use us. So do it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.